What's up ladies and gentlemen, my name is Sayushi and today I'm going to be giving you guys and gals a starter's guide to Elden Ring. I'm going to be trying to go into as much detail as I can about certain mechanics and parameters of the game that aren't really fully explained. Some things are explained, some things aren't explained, and some things are talked about but not really elaborated upon. And generally speaking, I've spent about 30 hours in this game right now, so I think I'm at a pretty good point where I understand a lot of the mechanics and kind of wanted to share with you all the things that I wish I knew, the things that I wish the game explained. Generally speaking, I'm going to end up having timestamps for each of the different categories, and we're going to go through 10 big different categories overall. So for starters, we're going to acknowledge the fact that for a lot of people, this might be your first Souls-like. So what is a Souls-like? Generally, a Souls-like is going to be an intentionally hard game for the sake of being rewarding. And while I would argue that uh, Elden Ring is probably one of the hardest Souls-like games out there, uh, it also ends up being the most approachable. And I've seen a lot of people make the argument that Elden Ring is too easy. And to that, I say that they're looking at the game's difficulty curve wrong. So. I would say, for example, a game like Dark Souls 2 would be a lot harder than Elden Ring, but most of all, that's because you're dealing with a lot of garbage mechanics. Elden Ring, mechanically, the player has the most freedom that they've ever had, not only with experimentation, but also with player control. And because of it, it means that the game is a lot easier to uh, learn and control your character and so on and so forth, but it does mean that the enemies can end up being much more ruthless. This is where I would say that this game is a more genuine difficulty rather than dealing with frustrating mechanics. Elden Ring is also going to end up being the first open world game by developed by From Soft. And what does open world mean essentially for this game and for the franchise? Well, it means that we can end up finding random enemies out in the world that would be able to end up dropping various items, not only for crafting, but also just pieces of gear and stuff. You know, the standard affair that you would expect. You can end up finding various plants and various harmless animals that you can end up gathering materials from. And thankfully, if you end up resting at a shrine, uh, site of grace, almost everything ends up respawning, save for certain mini bosses and certain tough opponents might not end up respawning, but it means that farming for materials is essentially really, really easy. I actually very, very much prefer this over most open worlds where you might gather a plant and it never comes back, or generally speaking, you might gather a plant and then have to wait an associated amount of time for it to return. Now, with this game being as difficult as it is, it means that you have to acknowledge when you are just overmatched. Sometimes you're going to come across a tough opponent that you just need to calm Calmly take a deep breath, leave and think to yourself, I will defeat this later because this game being as difficult as it is means that it also intentionally has difficulty spikes. Like I know that a lot of people might be at the first step, which is the intro of the game. And you might notice that there is going to end up being a gold knight over here, just chilling. And he is particularly powerful. It's kind of the first beginner's trap of the game to make you aware of the fact that this world is hostile and you are not intended to kill absolutely everything right away. To me, this is one of the defining differences between Dark Souls games and a Souls-like game like Sekiro, because Sekiro personally just didn't really vibe with me, and I think it's because that game had a set difficulty and there was nothing you could do about it, whereas games like Dark Souls and Elden Ring and even Bloodborne, all of these games are very heavily related to being an RPG, which means that as we're defeating enemies, we are gaining experience points that we, we can then end up spending um, uh, to upgrade our character and make ourselves stronger, upgrade our gear, and so on and so forth. So maybe a particularly tough opponent ends up becoming way easier the later you get in the game. Elden Ring also takes some big strides in making the game frustrating but less stressful because while a Site of Grace is going to end up acting as a respawn point essentially, you can also end up finding these statues out in the world that are called Sites of America. And essentially what they're going to do is act as a well, as a temporary respawn point. So if you would die in the area, you'll have the option of spawning at the nearest site of America uh, or Shrine of America if there is one nearby versus going back to the site of grace that you recently rested at. 
Usually they'll end up having these respawn locations near tough opponents so that you don't have to just run through all of the enemies to get back to the area that you were fighting in. And death is not very consequential in this game because all that really happens is when you die, you end up dropping all of your runes, which you can see is in the bottom right of the corner of the screen. There we go. So the runes is going to end up acting as the item that you get from most enemies and is going to end up being both a currency as well as your experience points that you can spend to level up your character. And essentially what happens is if I would die right here, it means that I would drop all of the runes that I had on my person at this specific location. And then I would basically just have to run back there and grab them before they ended up uh, being deleted by me being killed again. So uh, essentially you're always going to end up dropping a death pile, but it's very easily recovered. Sometimes it might be difficult because there might be a particularly strong enemy guarding it, or maybe you got to get through a particularly difficult situation. In which case, if you die again while your death pile is still on the ground, that death pile will then be deleted in favor of the new souls that you have accumulated or the new runes that you've accumulated, sorry, that will then end up being dropped on the ground. Now, with all of that explained, what is the overall goal of the game? The way that you beat it, essentially. The way that you beat it is going to be going to the main castles of the game, which you can see these uh, sites of grace essentially are going to end up pointing to the nearest significant location, which in this case, or in this area's case, is going to end up being Stormvale Castle, where you're going to end up fighting Godric, which is the first lord of the game. You can at any point go anywhere else in the game and start fighting the next boss, even before you've defeated the first one. But the overall goal is that there's going to end up being, uh, I think there's six lords, if I'm correct. Uh, and by defeating all of them, you'll end up gaining various power-ups and essentially getting closer and closer to the end of the game. But that said, the open world sprinkles in all of these mini accomplishments with uh, mini bosses, some of them being very, very massive and insane, like over there in that swamp area, there's a dragon for the beginning of the game. Uh, and then also there's, you know, catacombs and caves and smaller dungeons associated all over the place. And then these bigger castles is what the game refers to as a legacy dungeon, which is going to end up being much, much more complicated and have much more difficult challenges. So now that we've got the overall broad strokes of the game covered, let's talk about the classes in the game, because this is going to be the first thing that you'll choose and is actually way more important than you would think. Not only do you get to pick the character that you think looks the coolest, but if we end up showing status, we can actually see all of the starting stats of the character as well as the starting equipment. Now, the starting stats isn't as important as you would think. It will end up making a difference for your current play style for the early portions of the game. But if you end up, say, leveling up a lot and putting all of your stats into vigor, for example, and then maybe that's a mistake, well, rest assured that later on in the game, fairly later on, you will be able to respec your character, which will essentially put your stats back to the default of the class and allow you to reallocate your stats so that you could end up essentially building towards whatever weapon type you wanted. You could end up taking the Vagabond and slowly but surely at one point in the game, you could gain enough levels, respec your character, and force yourself to being a magic character, whereas you could end up being a, a, an astrologer, and then later on you could force yourself into being a warrior. But the most important factor of the game, I would say, is the starting gear, because the gear itself is something that you will eventually be able to find out in the open world, but if you don't know where to look, it's going to be very, very tough to find. Like, for example, I've got 30 hours in the game and I haven't found the uh, armor that the Vagabond is wearing right here. I did, however, pick the Samurai as my starting character, and I, in fact, ended up finding the Katana hidden in a catacomb, and then I found a merchant over in a decaying dragon biome that ended up selling the Samurai armor. So it's always going to be a, a... You're always going to be able to obtain all of the items that all of the classes have. It just might be several hours before you find it, and you may never find it if you don't end up eventually looking up online or just randomly discovering it for yourselves. I would say, generally speaking, that the game is broken down into melee combat or ranged, and ranged can end up taking on the form of using a bow, uh, but generally speaking is going to end up taking on the form of using various spells. Now, on top of the starting gear for your character, the other important thing you gotta keep in mind is the keepsake. 
So keepsake is basically going to be an item that you can give yourself for an advantage at the start of the game. And you have various options of what you're going to pick. So, you know, you could take the crimson, uh, amber, amulet which ends up increasing your hp you can find this out in the world but it's gonna probably be a while before you end up finding it organically uh the lands between rune is basically an item that you'll consume which will end up giving you runes which is the experience in the game as mentioned previously golden seed will allow you to increase your flask capacity so i would actually say that that's probably one of the best starting items that you can get you will find golden seeds throughout the world though the imp ashes is going to be a summon that you can use in single player only however you'll only be able to use this summon once you've gotten your summoning bell which we'll talk about where you get that a little bit later uh the cracked pot uh, essentially will give you the option of more crafted item capacity so if you're crafting fire bombs for example uh, every cracked pot that you have in your inventory essentially means that you could craft more fire po uh, fire bombs at a time to end up using rather than craft one use it craft another use it so on and so forth the stones word key is going to be used at various areas in the game to unlock kind of secret areas uh or treasure rooms essentially uh, which i'll show you what this looks like in a moment as well there is one near the beginning of the game but you will end up finding these stones word keys throughout the game as well and finding more of these doors the bewitching branch if i'm not mistaken is the item that makes you prevent having a death pile so it will essentially use one of these items when you die and instead of you losing your runes you'll just end up respawning with everything the boiled prawn is going to end up being a food item which as you can see gives you a physical damage negation so food items in the game there's no hunger or anything to speak of but food is going to end up giving you specific stat boosts and then finally there's going to end up being this item that will end up uh, attracting the aggression of enemies as it says so you could essentially use that when you're in co-op or something like that so that you can end up uh, pulling the enemies to you if you wanted to. So at the beginning of the game, you'll end up being thrown into a very confusing tutorial that's barely going to show you anything. And then you're going to end up getting defeated by a boss. And then you'll end up being thrown into this area right here. So going to the left is going to skip the actual like essential tutorial of the game and just throw you into the open world. However, you can end up jumping down here where the game is going to end up teaching you various mechanics. But we're going to end up skipping that and just kind of going up here and I'm going to briefly mention a couple key elements of the game that the game doesn't really teach you that well. Uh, so the stones word key I mentioned as a starting item is going to end up opening these doors right here uh, or these types of doors I should say that you'll end up finding out in the world uh, and then the sight of grace is going to end up essentially acting as your bonfire of the game. So this is going to end up being an area you can rest to recharge your flasks, level up and so on and so forth. These are also going to end up acting as fast travel points, but you'll notice that at the early portion of the game, you don't actually have any map associated. So if you actually head just straight to the north into the Great Front Ruins, which you can't really miss it, it's pretty obvious, you're going to end up finding uh, your first map item over here. And how do you end up seeing, uh, you know, how do you unlock the map essentially? Well, while you're exploring the world, there is going to end up being a fog of war. So you can kind of see it over here. I haven't really explored this gray area, right? What you're trying to look for on your map is these right here so this is actually an undiscovered area for me but this icon right here is where i would have to go in order to end up unlocking the map for this specific region which essentially ends up giving you all these fancy pictures it doesn't mean that you can't end up unlocking sites of grace and fast travel points those will always end up uh being around but uh, you know, it's important to end up unlocking the map. The other super important thing in the game is going to end up being your iframes and vulnerability frames, essentially, where when you roll, you're going to end up having uh, a certain amount of frames of your character's animation that you're going to be invincible. You're going to be able to avoid taking damage. And there's going to end up being three different forms of uh, rolling, which you can see if I open up my inventory and you can see in the bottom right, I have medium load. So the load is dependent on your endurance stat. Your endurance stat makes it so that you can carry more weight while not being affected by it as much. So 
by having medium load, I'm essentially in the middle where I have, you know, this this is my rolling right now. Uh, I'm pretty good at dodging and I have a pretty decent amount of idle uh, iframes, right? So if I end up putting on this super duper heavy sword, for example, it's going to end up bringing me into heavy load or as lots of people in the Souls community call it fat rolling, where my character still walks at the same animation, but my rolling is suddenly way slower. I can't spam it as often. And... Uh, you're going to end up having much less of a window of invulnerability. So essentially you would be more vulnerable to damage. So it's kind of a risk reward thing, but maybe you want to end up having heavy armor on. I don't know. Um, if I unequip enough of my items, though, you can see now I'm suddenly at light load, which, yes, my character looks like Waluigi. And at light load, you actually have uh, your roll travels at a further distance. You have more iframes, which means that it's riskier, but more rewarding just because of the fact that you are going to be able to avoid attacks more easily. Now, another important stat you have to keep in mind when you're changing your gear is poise. Poise is essentially going to end up meaning how heavy your character is, not in terms of the equipment load necessarily, although they do go hand in hand usually. Heavy armor usually, you know, weighs a lot, which means that your equip load goes up, but usually it also means that you're going to end up gaining more poise. And poise is essentially how often your character is going to end up being stunned based on the heaviness of the attack of the enemy. So if you have very, very high poise, it means that you could essentially get hit by a really heavy attack and your character will still continue his follow through with his attack animation and basically just act like nothing happened. You'll still take the damage, but you'll essentially not be interrupted. Uh, whereas having very low poise means that you could get hit by a goblin's dagger and your character's just going to end up getting sunlocked for a little while right there, right? So it's another stat that's very important to keep in mind. Let's talk about how you're going to end up actually using magic on your character because weapons and armor and stuff you essentially will end up just finding out in the world and you can end up getting uh, rare drops off of enemies to end up finding their gear usually. You know, if you see an enemy with a greatsword, chances are you could farm it over and over and over again until it ends up dropping the greatsword, which means that that weapon would then end up having a certain amount of stats that would end up being associated to it, which we'll get into momentarily. But magic is going to be something that you will also end up finding out in the world. And uh, basically you'll end up resting at a site of grace and you'll end up having the option to memorize a spell. And you can see that as you play through the game, you'll end up finding these, uh, I think they're called like talismans of remembrance or something or memory talisman or something. Uh, essentially that is going to end up being an item that will give you more options to memorize spells. So normally you'll end up starting with two slots for magic, but as you end up finding more of these talismans in the world, it essentially will just be a permanent upgrade to your character where you'll have more and more spell slots. I can't really use a lot of these spells just because I don't really have my stats high enough, um, as you can see with the little X mark next to them. But generally speaking, there is a lot, a lot, a lot of different spells that you'll end up finding in the game that will end up having different stats associated with. So it's going to mostly be based off of intelligence, faith, and arcane. So each of those is kind of going to end up being the same as the melee weapons of the game, where some weapons will scale off of dexterity, whereas other weapons will end up scaling off of strength. But it always is going to end up being good to end up having a mix or a match, uh, you know, mix mash of any of the stats that you want to associate to your character. And just because you're using melee weapons doesn't necessarily mean that you won't end up having certain special abilities that might not be accessible to mages because of the fact that a mage might not be able to end up wielding the weapon in the first place, right? So first of all, you're going to see the attribute required in the bottom middle of the screen and that's going to end up being the you know it's very simple it's just the stats that are required to end up using the weapon efficiently however sometimes you could end up seeing like a weapon like this let's just say for example so this takes 40 strength i could actually use this great sword if i had 20 strength if i actually used it in two hands because by two-handing a weapon, you are essentially cutting the strength requirement in half. Not necessarily the dex or other stats, but strength more specifically, just because it makes sense that your character's two-handing it, so they're more proficient with the weapon, right? 
but obviously, you know, my equip load ends up going up and blah, blah, blah. So that's why I always end up using the katana. And you can see a very quick and easy, uh, you know, uh, the physical damage goes up on my katana just because I've leveled it up. Uh, the guard damage negation goes down quite a bit just because obviously this weapon's bigger, so it's got a lot more resistances. That essentially means that if I'm using this in two hands and I'm blocking with it, that's what those stats are then going to end up being. However, a shield more often than not is going to end up being better at blocking, obviously, and certain shields will end up being better for blocking magic damage. Certain shields will be better for blocking heavy attacks. And then and depending on the weight of the shield, uh, similar to what I mentioned before with poise, it means that you will end up being more defensive. Uh, you know, you'll be able to tank more hits with your shield just because the shield is going to end up being heavier and thus you're going to take less hit to your stamina. But anyways, moving back to the katana right here, you can see the attribute scaling is strength D dex C, which means that the value associated with the damage that I do with this weapon, it's scaling off of both strength and dex. Whereas if I look at this weapon right here, you can see the strength attribute goes to C, which of course is blue because it's a better value, which means, uh, you know, essentially it goes A, B, C, D, E, F, G, whatever. Uh, probably just goes to F. I haven't seen anything at that grade yet. But what that means is that by having higher strength, I would be able to use this weapon with greater uh, damage numbers and greater stats because this weapon scales off of both strength and dexterity. And usually you want to end up using a weapon that scales uh, with the higher value particularly. But another really important thing to keep in mind is that certain weapons will end up having passive effects, armor as well, but generally you can see causes blood loss build up 45, which means that if I tag an enemy enough times with the katana, I'll end up building up a status effect of blood loss, which means that when that ends up proccing, uh, or, you know, or going off, then the enemy is going to just have a big chunk of its health drained, right? So certain weapons will end up doing these effects certain ones won't. So you can see this arcane dagger, for example, right here is going to end up having a higher value to the blood loss buildup. However, the overall damage of it might not necessarily be better, but because it's a dagger, it means that I can build up that status effect better than with my katana because I can attack faster with this. So that's where you kind of want to take into account um, do you want to end up building your character towards inducing status effects rather than doing raw physical damage? Entirely up to you. But one of the most important things with melee characters is going to end up being the Ashes of War. And these are going to be special abilities that you'll obtain throughout the world that you can associate with specific weapons like weapon types. So one of the abilities that I have on my katana, for example, is this blood slash, which deals a lot of damage and is essentially going to end up taking both my health and my FP. Now I will be able to cast this ability even when I don't have any FP, but obviously the proficiency of the ability is not going to end up being that great. However, Here's the cool thing about this, is if we go to the Ashes of War and I select my katana, you can see I've got a lot of other abilities that I've found throughout the world. And you can see that having this one, I will essentially give myself a buff that increases the holy damage with this weapon. Uh, but it means that the scaling is going to end up changing. As you can see, this scales, uh, my strength and dex go down to E, but my faith goes up to C, which previously the katana didn't have any scaling towards C. However, if you don't want to end up changing the uh, attribute scaling of the weapon, let me just select this right here. You can see we've got multiple options of how we're going to end up, uh, you know, uh, uh, changing the affinity of the weapon. So if I set it to standard, that means it's going to end up having the default stats of the weapon because I obviously have strength and dex, so why would I bother changing it? Heavy will end up changing the strength attribute, which you can see uh, makes it a little bit better when I'm two-handing the weapon, but a lot worse when I'm using it in a one hand. Uh, keen is going to end up making it scale more off of dexterity. Quality just ends up increasing its overall damage with two-handed as well. And sacred makes it the one that is associated with this spell in particular. However, if I end up changing it to the sacred and then whoops, that's not the one that I want, I can always just change it. 
at any point in time, you can always end up changing the ashes of war. So it pays to experiment. And you can also always end up undoing the enchantment outright. And the reason why you might want to do this is certain weapons will end up having their own default abilities. Not all weapons, but certain ones. So the katana, for example, if I end up holding the ability, this will end up being a horizontal slash or I can do a vertical slash. Each of those attacks is going to end up draining my FP or my mana, uh, but it does mean that I don't have that blood ability anymore. So you kind of got to just pick the one that you want for the, any given situation. A lot of the abilities you might notice aren't particularly good for fighting random enemies in the game. And a lot of that is because some of these abilities are scaled specifically to work with PvP against other players. Anyways, let's move on. So once you get through the tutorial area, you're going to end up coming out here. And one of the first things you might want to do is start playing co-op with your friends. In order to do this inside the starting area, it's going to end up having a finger item that you'll pick up uh, and that's going to end up unlocking the co-op, which co-op is going to be something that you can do very easily in this game, but not necessarily immediately just because of the items that are going to be required in order for you to be the host. So if you're trying to play with your friend, for example, it might take a little bit before you get going. So in this menu, essentially, there's going to end up being these various items that you'll unlock through the game which is going to end up being the furled finger which essentially is me putting this down so that i can then be summoned by somebody else and i'll explain how you do that in a minute but then there's also going to end up being the duelist finger so this is specifically for people that are trying to duel each other trying to pvp and then there's going to end up being the bloody finger which is going to end up making you invade other players so if you're in single player you can't be invaded as soon as you're online with somebody else, you can be invaded. And what an invader does is it's going to end up being another player that enters your world. None of the enemies in the world are going to attack them, but their goal is to kill the host. That's it. That is their goal. If they succeed in doing that, then it means that they've won and they'll leave. And then you just feel butthurt because you got to go and gather your souls and stuff like that. But of course, you know, the thing is, there's usually going to end up being more of you than there are of them. However, the multiplayer can actually go up to four players in total, uh, including the hosts uh, that are all playing in co-op. But essentially, the more players that you have in your world, the more often you are going to be invaded. And while you can have one person in co-op with you or two people in co-op with you, uh, essentially three people, including the host, it means that you're more than likely going to be invaded, but you'll still only be invaded by one person. However, if you go up to four people in co-op all playing together, it means that you are going to be invaded very often and you can be invaded by two invaders at the same time. So you're at a very, very distinct disadvantage by doing this. And essentially, in order for you to end up playing with your friends, you'll end up setting up a password. So if I just set this up to, I don't know, JubJub is the main password that I use with my buddies. So now essentially what that means is I can't be summoned by any random players anymore. So if I put my sign down, for example, right here at this specific location, then my friend would be in their world at this location and then they would consume a fur calling finger remedy which is an item that you can very easily end up crafting in the game uh just for those of you that don't know go to that church right away you'll find a merchant and he'll give you a bunch of crafting components uh or crafting recipes i should say uh that you can then end up using to craft various items and you'll get more of these crafting items throughout the game but generally speaking the finger remedy is going to end up costing uh, earthly flowers, which are literally everywhere. It's super duper cheap in order to end up uh, using it and then summoning players, right? So the host of the world is going to end up having to consume one of these items in order to see the summon sign and summon their friend. However, if I turned the password off, it means that anyone that's within my level range would be able to see my summon sign and summon me because there are going to end up being specific ranges for summoning and if you end up going into uh, catacombs or caves and stuff like that 
there will end up being what the game refers to as a summoning pool. So what that means is that I would then end up using the small golden effigy instead. So it sends a cooperative summon sign to several nearby summoning pools. If you are summoned, you will be transported to that summoned pool's location in the host player's world and multiplayer will begin. So essentially, near as I know, it means that I could put this down and basically just wander around throughout the game so long as this is active, right? And it basically means that instead of people summoning me through this specific location right here, uh, any summoning pools that I'm nearby, people will end up seeing my summon sign. So I could be hanging out in an area and uh, another player might randomly see that I'm in the pool and then they could summon me. Same with the small red effigy for dueling. Now, what are these other items up here? So this is going to be how you remove yourself or remove others from multiplayer. And then eventually you can end up finding the Taunter's Tongue, which is an item that will specifically open you up for invaders. What's the difference between an invader and somebody that's trying to duel you? Well, somebody that's trying to duel is uh, uh, essentially being honorable and trying to do a 1v1, whereas an invader is going to be someone that's specifically trying to join your world and make your or day bad. And based on the fact that there's this empty category right here, I would assume that it's going to end up being the bloody finger effigy, which I just haven't found yet. Probably get it from invading or something. And what do you actually get from invading? Well, you get a bunch of XP and so on and so forth. But what these items essentially are going to do is be an item that you can toggle on. And the blue cipher makes it so that uh, uh, if someone is in a, a, a world that gets invaded, I will essentially end up being summoned to help that person. And then once the invader is dead, I'll end up leaving. Whereas the white cipher uh, will make it so that if I was in multiplayer with my friends, this essentially means that I'm sending out a beacon to those that have the blue cipher on. So this essentially means that uh, I'm calling in help when I end up getting invaded. So another super important thing that you're going to note is as you're traveling through the game and finding more sites of grace, um, essentially as you find more sites of grace, the game is going to slowly give you the mount uh, and then it's also going to end up giving you the round table hold, which is going to end up being a fast travel point right over here. And this is going to end up acting as like the main hub area of the game. So as you're out in the world talking to certain characters, sometimes they'll show up here as a permanent character that you can either advance a quest line with, or maybe they're going to end up being a merchant. And some of them, like this guy in particular, I can trade him scrolls to end up increasing his inventory of uh, spells and so on and so forth. There's also going to end up being the smith over here which will be used to upgrade your weapons and so on and so forth. And then eventually, if you end up finding, uh, you know, there's a character. Sorry, I just feel that this is essential. At the Stormhill Shack, as you're on your way up to Stormvale Castle, you'll talk to this character and then she'll end up appearing in here. You can inquire to the smith about her and essentially uh, start a quest chain that eventually has her go here, which will end up allowing you to upgrade your summoning bell. And your summoning bell is going to end up being something that you will end up getting uh, from an NPC that shows up at the Church of Ella during the night time. So you'll end up seeing this character show up specifically during the night, and then you can end up getting the summoning bell. Uh, and essentially, the summoning bell is only going to be able to use in single player and will end up summoning various specters to end up helping you for a certain duration. It's kind of the way of counteracting playing in co-op and playing in single player specifically so that you can summon these guys you can only summon them under certain uh you know very specific situations though so yeah but the point is that you can end up upgrading your summons at her with different materials than the smith upgrading your weapons specifically I also want to mention that at the first step, there's going to end up being an NPC that you'll talk to at the beginning of the game. And uh, once you end up unlocking the round table, I'd recommend that you go back to him and talk to him because he's going to end up essentially giving you some quests over here. And more specifically, uh, I'm pretty sure he's required to give you access to this doorway right here, which is going to end up being where this NPC is, which is very, very important because she is going to be where you'll end up trading your boss souls or remembrances, as the game calls them. So uh, essentially, there's going to end up being the main bosses of the game that are going to end up being in these gigantic dungeons that are called legacy dungeons. So not just the random catacombs. This is a huge, expansive area. 
So the first, the you know, normal boss of the game is going to be Godric. You don't have to fight him. You could go and try to fight the next one right away. But generally speaking, uh, you know, the recommended boss that you fight early on is going to be Godric. And once you kill him, you're going to end up getting a greater rune as well as a remembrance. And when you come over to this lady right here, you'll be able to receive power of remembrance, which essentially is trading the boss's remembrance or the boss soul, as it were, for various items. So, for example, Godric has uh, the option of giving you both a uh, dragon head and the axe. So I ended up going for the axe. Uh, there are areas in the game that I don't want to go into too much detail about, but there are areas in the game that are quite significant where you can actually duplicate a remembrance. So this I would only recommend that you do in an instance where maybe the materials that or maybe the items that you get out of a boss's remembrance, maybe you want both of them on your first playthrough because this game has new game plus, And so you could essentially end up getting the other item in your second playthrough, right? But the point is that the duplication of remembrances is going to end up being very, very difficult and very uncommon. So you'll end up finding a lot of areas that you can end up doing it, but the items with which you're going to need in order to duplicate remembrances are few and far between. So just saying. Uh, the other option that this old grandma is going to have is able to purchase certain boss equipment. So for example, I beat the second Lord and she was a humanoid and ended up having these various items on her. So I would, I'm now able to actually buy her items specifically out of this shop. And the reason why this is important and why I said it's a humanoid is because Godric, on the other hand, doesn't unlock this shop because he's kind of a weird freak, right? Like he's kind of a mutant with like a weird bunch of arms and junk like that. And essentially, he it wouldn't really make sense that we would be able to buy his clothes and put them on our character. So the game kind of tries to hold this specific logic. So while we're on the topic of beating the main essential bosses of the game, I did want to mention the greater runes, which requires me to actually go to a site of grace. So just give me a second here. So so some greater runes will require you to go out of your way to power them up. So Godric, for example, you have to actually travel across this bridge to the Divine Tower in order to end up powering it up. Whereas I didn't seem to need to do that at the Second Lord, which I found a bit odd. But anyways, if we end up resting at a Site of Grace, you can see that there is great runes as a category. And essentially, you'll end up getting more of these the further you get into the game and the more lords you defeat. But as of right now, I only have the one. And what this is going to do is raise all of my attributes. So how do I actually end up getting that buff specifically? Well, there's going to end up being this other item right here called a rune arc. You'll find these throughout the game, but an easy way that you can end up grinding these is by joining another player's world and helping that player defeat the boss of the area, whether it be in catacombs or a lord itself, that's how you'll end up getting rune arcs. And by consuming the rune arc, you are essentially going to end up gaining the ability of the greater rune. If I die though, I would end up losing this, this effect, but you can see in the top left that the rune ability uh, is yellow, which means that it is actually on right now. And something I wanted to briefly mention is that the second Lord is essentially going to end up having the rune ability uh, of allowing you to respec your character stats, which, I had mentioned earlier in the video. But now back at the round table hold, uh, as I mentioned previously, if you end up killing any of these essential characters in the game uh, at any point, what essentially is going to happen is you would not be able to advance their quest line if they had one. Usually you'll end up getting their gear. So I actually had my buddy kill this guy because he thought it was evil. Uh, and then he ended up getting all of his armor and stuff like that. And I ended up killing Patches, which is a character that ends up being a shop in the game. But the thing is that the shop characters it doesn't really matter so much because you can always go over to the twins over here and you can offer a bell bearing. So you'll usually get a bell bearing if you kill a character that is going to end up being a shop in this area. And then we would still be able to go into her inventory or Patch's inventory and be able to buy all of these different items that he would have normally sold if I let him live. So now let's touch upon a couple final things right here at the site of Grace, just because I feel like these are very important important things that the game does talk about, but only briefly. So if you go to level up, you can see all of the highlighted abilities or skills are what's going to increase 
as I end up leveling up these specific stats. However, Arcane will end up increasing a bunch of stats uh, as well as your Discovery. So Discovery is going to end up basically being your luck stat. So the higher your Discovery, the more often you'll end up getting drops from enemies. And in the Flask category, you can end up adding Flask charges when you find Golden Seeds. So you can actually start with one of those as a keepsake, but you'll also end up finding them throughout the world at these tiny little golden trees that you'll end up finding. Um, at uh, chapels, like the one that you see in the background right there, more often than not, they'll end up containing uh, a sacred tear, which is an item that is going to be used to increase the potency of your flask, which means that it'll heal more HP or more FP in a single swig. Uh, versus allocating charges, you can always end up doing this, and essentially I have eight healing potions, but maybe I want to have one of them associated with uh, mana, or maybe I just want to have all of them. And another really cool thing is the Wondrous Physic, which I'll just mention very briefly that over here is going to end up being the Third Church of America. I'd recommend that you go there, maybe not necessarily right away, uh, but essentially this is going to end up being another flask that you'll end up getting. You'll only ever end up having one of these. Maybe you get more later on, I don't know. But you'll end up finding these crystal tears throughout the world. And what these are going to end up doing is giving you a temporary buff that you can pick and choose for your Physic Flask. And then, not to get too spoilery, but if you end up going into this coastal cave, it'll take you to this island over here. And over there, you'll end up finding, uh, somewhere throughout the process, you'll end up finding the items that let you alter your garments. Now, altering garments is kind of weird because not only does it end up changing the style of the armor, like you might have noticed if you picked a samurai, how come my samurai armor looks slightly different than yours? It's not because I upgraded it or anything, it's because I use the alter garment function, which actually has some slight stat changes. It doesn't really reflect it very well, but you can see if I just tap back and forth between these that the one that I currently have actually has more weight and a little bit more stats. So the compensation is that this is slightly heavier versus if I ended up, uh, you know, regressing back to the default version of this. There is very, very specific armor that can end up having these changes. I actually have quite a few pieces of armor right now, but I can't really change most of them. Anyways, I'm gonna have to edit this video down and put all of the timestamps and stuff, and uh, yeah, hopefully, uh, hopefully you enjoyed. Bye-bye.